many people tend to start to think about individual consumption choices. Um, and that's a, a valid and important way to, to come at these issues. But what we're gonna focus on these next couple of days is a different way of, of looking at them, which is really um, through the, the lens of, of what people call environmental justice and environmental racism, um, which is the uh, essentially refers to the fact that there is a, a disproportionate impact of envir various forms of pollution on communities of color and low-income communities around the country um, and around the world. And, and this is something that's been proven sort of time and time again through research. The, the first important uh, sort of research study happened back in <coughs> 1987 when Dr. Robert Bullard, uh, working under contract with the United Church of Christ's Commission on Racial Justice, uh, did a study in which he uh, got the data about all of the known toxic contaminated sites uh, around the country from all of the state environmental agencies as well as from the federal government. He plotted those on a, on a map and then overlay census data on top of that map. And the, and the patterns that emerged were very clear. I mean, essentially, uh, the, the higher percentage of community of persons of color who lived in a community and the poorer that community the more likely it was that though that that community would be host to a number of contaminated sites and subsequent research determined uh, not only validated that finding but also determined that um, that it took longer for contaminated sites in those environmental justice or EJ communities to get designated as contaminated sites. And that's significant because the way that this stuff works, until something is designated, it's not going to get cleaned up. Um, and that then once it was designated, the, the remedies for cleanup that were chosen were routinely less thorough and less expensive than the remedies that were chosen in wealthier and whiter communities. So part of what I'd, I'd like to encourage you to think about uh, on this tour and, and through this time we've got together now is is how does this kind of understanding about the environment um, impact our understanding of what we should be doing as leaders? Um, obviously, it's important for us on an individual level uh, to, to change our own personal consumption habits and to do that as uh, both as a, the right thing to do and also as a model to others. But what I'd like to, to suggest is that without being aware of the systemic racism and prejudice that's embedded in the political and economic systems and, and being willing to sort of put our shoulders up against that, we're not going to be able to get uh, communities that are clean and healthy for all people. And that's obviously, as a sort of group of religious leaders, that's something that, that matters deeply to all of us, all of our traditions. Uh, hold those kinds of values in common. Can you repeat the name of the doctor that did the study? Yep, Dr. Robert Bullard. It's actually, uh, it's the, say Karen, it's the, say it's the author of one of the articles that you sent me. Um, and I'll send you, uh, he's, he's down at Clark University in Atlanta and has a, a, probably the most extensive online set of environmental justice resources that exist. I'll send you the, the link to that. Flap came up uh, up on yeah. top of it. Uh, oh, thank you. The... <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting to, to think about this because, as I've, I've said a number of times, Newark uh, for um, and, and many old industrial cities in the United States were real economic engines for the growth of, of this country <laughs> for many, many decades. Uh, you know, unemployment now in Newark at a formal level is, I think, between 15 and 16 percent, but in reality, it's probably closer to 25 percent, I would guess. Um, it used to be that there were, you know, thousands and thousands of industrial-related jobs in Newark, and you see how the, the banks of the Passaic River, which before there were superhighways, were the, the conduits of a lot of commerce, you know, the banks of the river aligned with old abandoned industrial sites. Um, back then, there wasn't nearly the level of understanding about the dangers of toxic contamination uh, that there are now. 
Um, and to some degree also, um, there were trade-offs that were made. I mean, people's life expectancy was shorter then, and people were, you know, were, were eager to work um, as people are now, and in those kinds of situations, trade-offs get made. But the result of that is that, uh, you know, we've got, uh, we, you know, we use Newark as our classroom for, um, for this tour because um, while it's in better shape than it was 20 years ago, it is still a city that struggles with a lot of issues related to poverty, a lot of issues related to, to race, um, and a lot of issues related to pollution. One of the things that most people know about Newark from listening to the national media or think they know about Newark is that it's a sort of a place where an awful lot of gun violence happens. That gets an enormous amount of, of media attention in New Jersey and, and nationally. What most people don't realize, uh, there are, according to the um, statistics from the, the state, the New Jersey State Department of Health, um, there are about, give or take, in every, any year, about 400 gun-related deaths in New Jersey as a state each year. The state's own research shows that there are more than 2,000 air pollution-related deaths, premature deaths, in the state each year. So it's an interesting example of how things get framed by the media and, uh, you know, many people have a visceral fear, understandably related to gun violence. Very few people have that same visceral kind of reaction to air pollution, but the reality is that, that the number of lives lost and the amount of suffering that's caused is, uh, you know, is, is equal or greater by a substantial margin. So, where do you get that data? Uh, the, Sarah asked where where I got the data. I went on the uh, the website of the State Department of Health, and they have mortality figures. So I went and saw, you know, what do people die from in New Jersey? They don't have air pollution listed there. So for that figure, the State Department of Environmental Protection does air pollution modeling, and and they don't make a lot publicity wise of that figure, but it's there in their reports. So four hundred so, versus four thousand. Over two thousand. Um, asking, you know, what are, what, how does air pollution essentially kill people um, through a combination of respiratory, cardiovascular, and cancer-related illnesses. Um, you know, the uh, emphysema, um, lung cancer, though the, the main thing is, is essentially um, heart disease through impeded cardiovascular function. Anna knows a bit more about that than I do and can, can speak to that in, in sort of greater detail. So, um, but you'll, you'll see and you'll sort of get a, a sense over the next couple of hours that not only is there a, a sort of, you know, an urban center here with a lot of, of diesel traffic, you've also, you've got the port, which, which has about 7,000 truck trips per day in and out of the port. So that's a very substantial amount of, of air pollution coming from that. You have all of the diesel equipment operating at the ports. You have the ships themselves which, thanks to the EPA, now have to burn a cleaner form of fuel. They used to be able to burn what was called bunker fuel, which was the dirtiest fuel possible when they came in and were sort of idling their engines at the port. Now they have to burn something that's that's a bit cleaner than that. Um, uh, and then you've also got the airport. So there are a lot of different sources of air pollution, toxic contamination, and, and noise pollution, and, and we'll, we'll learn some more about that today. So we'll, we're on our way now to uh, to pick up uh, Ana Baptista, and we should be to her in about five minutes or so. So we'll we'll sign back on that.